Good afternoon. Great to be with you this afternoon, and thank you so much for coming. As Joel and Naomi said, our question this lunchtime is, what does God know about suffering? And when we ask that question, there is an intellectual issue there. How do we square a loving God with such a hurting world? But for most of us, at some point, this question stops being theoretical. It becomes something we experience. We find ourselves in real pain. Or see those we love struggling emotionally, mentally, physically. The pain is real. And the questions are real too. And they demand an honest response, not simplistic platitudes. So thank you again for coming along this lunchtime. We're going to be covering things that are not easy to think about and not easy for me to say. And yet, I am glad to be here because what I found in Jesus makes a difference even in pain. Now, when we think about suffering, plenty of pictures come to mind, leaping out at us from our phones or news pages. I wonder what comes to yours. Maybe an image like this, Grenfell Tower smoking on the London skyline. What image fills your head? Possibly thousands of images of suffering drawn from all over the world, big and small. For me, it's this image. This is my friend Rebecca, and next to her is me. Actually me, and I know what you're thinking, I have not aged well. These, I haven't, have I? These eight years have been very cruel to me. Um, but I, I can't think about this question without thinking about her. She and I were English students together um, in college, and... I loved her. She was one of my best friends. She was a brilliant rower. She was a cox, you can probably tell from her height. Uh, she had a lively mind, and she was pretty much universally loved. And when, in our third year, we all got the news that she died in a car crash, I began to experience what suffering really was. It got to me. I was heartbroken, and in so many ways, still am today about this. I struggled to get out of bed, I was overrun with questions and, and worries and tears. And running through my head was the thought, where is God in this? What does he know about what I'm going through? Now, for some people, it's pretty clear. The fact of suffering shows that God isn't there at all. A few years ago, Stephen Fry was on Irish TV. You may have seen it. And he was asked what he'd say to God if there were a God. And he said, I'd say, bone cancer in children? What's that about? How dare you? How dare you create a world in which there's so much misery that isn't our fault? The moment you banish him, life becomes simpler, cleaner, purer, more worth living, in my opinion. And it's not just Stephen Fry. The philosopher Epicurus is supposed to have articulated it like this. If God is all-powerful, then he could stop suffering. If God is all-loving, then he wouldn't want there to be suffering. But there's suffering in our world. So either he's not powerful, or he's not good, or he's not there. Which is he? Cruel? Impotent? Or absent? It's a very powerful line of thinking, but... There are problems with it, just in terms of logic. What if the presence of suffering doesn't come down to cruelty or impotence? What if God has reason for it that we don't know, can't know? And the moment I say that, I think, what possible reason could he have for that? But that's exactly the point. We are limited in our perspective. I have no idea what those reasons could be. And look, if God were just like us and no bigger, then of course we'd expect to fully understand everything he does and rightly kick him out of the picture because of the suffering we see. But if God is bigger than we are, then it is at least possible that he has reasons for suffering we don't understand. And if we dismiss that possibility, then that's shallow thinking. If God is big enough to blame for our suffering, why wouldn't he be big enough to know something about suffering I don't? 
If God is bigger than we are, transcending our understanding, then this argument doesn't quite work anymore. And can I say, the God who is bigger than us is the only kind of God Christians have ever believed in. Now, nothing I've said is an answer to our question, but it does show that the presence of suffering in our world doesn't automatically mean the absence of God. And I'd want to go further. Suffering raises real questions for the believer, but it also raises huge questions for those who dismiss God. When we take God out of the picture, where are we left? Let's return to some words I quoted on Monday from Professor Richard Dawkins. I think he puts it honestly and succinctly. In a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect, if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Christians talk about the problem of suffering, the problem of evil, but at least we have a problem. Dismiss God, and you're left with no design, no purpose, no evil, no good. And in that meaningless universe, in what way is our suffering really a problem? In what way can we call it wrong? See, when we encounter suffering, our deepest instinct is to say, it shouldn't be that way. That's wrong. But take God out of the picture, and who's to say how things should or shouldn't be? What's right or wrong? Those things are nothing more than my opinion. And so this important objection becomes nothing more than preference if we take God out of the picture. The writer C.S. Lewis was an atheist who became a Christian, and facing the fact of suffering was part of his journey to faith. He wrote this. My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? That's something I had to wrestle with as I thought about Rebecca. I was full of sorrow and questions and anger in the wake of her death. But at the same time, I had to be honest. If we are nothing more than time plus matter plus chance, then nothing meaningful had happened. Rebecca was an accident, just like me, just like you. Some people get hurt, some people get lucky. But that conclusion makes no sense of her. She didn't feel like an accident, and we never treated her that way. She felt like a gift, someone who came into our lives, made us smile, laugh, cry, someone who was worth missing, someone who was worth crying over, a gift. And so someone who pointed to a giver. Taking God out of the picture looks like a simple, neat solution, but suffering is a reality that defies simplistic, easy answers. And taking God out of the picture turns out to be another one of those because it renders our pain meaningless. And could you really live as if your suffering meant nothing, as if it weren't truly, deeply, objectively wrong? At least suffering is a problem with God in the picture, and it's a problem he takes seriously. Here's something I found really comforting when I've gone to the Bible. It doesn't go in for easy answers or one-liner solutions. It doesn't short-circuit my hard questions, and it doesn't pour cold water on tears and lament and pain. In fact, there's a whole book of the Bible, the book of Job, which makes exactly that point. It says, don't try to give easy answers to suffering. There aren't any. Don't say that all suffering is punishment for sin. That's not true, and it would never be your place to say, even if it were. There are so many things that it's not my place to say, so I won't say them. And yet, I found that the Bible hasn't been silent. It's not been lacking in, in comfort. 
And while it isn't an exhaustive answer, what I found is a satisfying response. For the rest of this lunchtime, I want to share four of the key things Jesus says to us in our suffering. Here's the first one. Jesus says, it wasn't meant to be this way. Jesus looks at the suffering of our world and he says, it wasn't meant to be this way. There's a moment in Jesus' life when his close friend Lazarus falls ill and then dies. And when Jesus goes to his tomb, he's described as being deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And in the Greek, those words don't just mean that he was sorrowful. They mean that he was deeply angry. Because suffering in our world is worth getting angry about. So while I think that Stephen Fry's conclusions are way off base, his anger tells me that he understands something very real about suffering. Our world wasn't meant to be this way, which is why it makes us angry. Which is why the poet Dylan Thomas told his father not to go gentle into that good night, but to rage, rage against the dying of the light. According to Jesus, sorrow and anger are right responses to the way things are now because it wasn't meant to be this way. According to the Bible, reality is out of joint. Something about our world is deeply broken. We were made for a relationship with God, but our turning away from him and in on ourselves, our breaking of that relationship, has left our world broken too. And at this point, I find myself wondering, why would God let that happen? Why let us turn away? There's deep mystery there. I know so little about it. But part of it, a small part of it, is what he made us for. He made us to love him and be loved by him. And genuine love can't be programmed in. It has to be freely given. Which meant that there had to be a possibility of rejection for there to be love. And that rejection is what happened and continues to happen. Now, that is not to say that individual acts of wrongdoing lead to individual episodes of suffering. Not at all. Karma is not the conclusion to reach. But rather that suffering in our world is a clear sign to us that things aren't right. I'll quote C.S. Lewis again. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our consciences, but shouts to us in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Suffering alerts us to the fact that something is deeply wrong. It's a symptom of a broken world. And the underlying cause is our attitude to God that cuts him out of the picture. And at this point, I want to ask an awkward, uncomfortable question. Are we prepared to admit just how much suffering is human in origin? Even many of the natural disasters we see actually have human exploitation, wastefulness, and greed lurking at the bottom of them? Are we prepared to acknowledge that we have had a hand in the suffering of others, that we've played our part in hurting them? We look at the suffering in our world, and we often think, how could God allow that to happen? How could he allow that to exist? But so often, I'm complicit in it. So the question becomes, how could he allow me to exist? It wasn't meant to be this way. Suffering shows that something has gone very wrong and it's worth getting angry about, like Jesus does. But it isn't just anger with Jesus. Here's the second thing he says to our suffering. He says, it won't always be this way. It won't always be this way. This episode with Lazarus is remarkable because of what Jesus went there to do. He didn't just go there as a mourner, He went to end the morning by raising Lazarus from the dead. See, all through Jesus' life, you find accounts of him bringing healing to the sick, sight to the blind, hope to the cynical, and even life to the dead. Jesus was waging war on suffering everywhere he went. And everywhere he went, he was winning. Now, we might have all sorts of questions about the miraculous deeds Jesus is recorded as doing. And it's worth for now repeating that these are first century eyewitness documents and that none of Jesus' early opponents deny his ability to do these things. But can I say more than that? The miracles of Jesus aren't just divine party tricks 
raw displays of his power, each one of them is a pointer to what he intends for our world. You see, the Bible ends with a picture of a changed world, a world made new, a world without suffering in it. God comes out with a stunning promise that there will be no more death, no more mourning, no more pain. The God himself will wipe every tear from his people's eyes. Maybe you know J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, and that moment where Sam Gamgee, having thought Gandalf was dead, sees him alive and says, Gandalf, you're alive, but I thought you were dead. Does this mean that everything sad is going to come untrue? Tolkien could write those words because he was a Christian and he knew these promises of a world made new. He fed his imagination and his heart with them of a world where everything sad comes untrue. God doesn't intend for his world to languish in agony forever, but to wipe every tear away, to bring unspeakable comfort to the brokenhearted. And for those here who know the pain of suffering, that promise is worth digging into. It's worth holding out for. Because this is what we long for, isn't it? A world without the stuff of suffering in it. No more death, mourning, or pain. We are right to long for that world. We are right to view those things as intruders in our world. Because one day, that world without suffering will be a reality. But as beautiful as that promise is, it's pointing to a future we don't yet see. What does God offer hurting people today? Here's the third thing Jesus says to our suffering. Jesus looks at our suffering and says, I choose to suffer with you. That's God's response to a world of pain. He doesn't sit on a distant celestial throne. The claim of the Christian faith, unique among the religions of the world, is of a God who came down here and became one of us, and made this world of pain and struggle and suffering his home. Not indifferent, but involved. When we see suffering in our world, we're inclined to rage at God. Even in the Bible, you find believers coming very close to doing that. We rage at God. We say, okay, God, your move. This is a world full of suffering and pain, and as far as I can see, you're cruel. You're impotent. What's your move, God? And this is his move. Not to give us an explanation or a telling off, but to give us a person. In Jesus, God gives us himself. And in knowing him, it's not that our questions go away, but being in a relationship with him changes things. No, I don't know everything, but now... I find I know enough. Here's why. Jesus looks at my pain and your pain and says, I choose to suffer with you. In Jesus, God knows what it's like to suffer. At the tomb of Lazarus, before he raises his friend from the dead, Jesus weeps. Why did he do that? Because he cares. I don't know if you have a favorite Christmas carol, I probably couldn't pick one, but I have a least favorite Christmas carol, one that I absolutely hate, Away in a Manger. The tune is terrible and ugh, it's usually sung by anemic choirs of children, but it gets worse. The song contains an outright lie. The little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. That is a lie. It makes Jesus sound immune to pain, but the evidence tells us he felt the pain. We're not alone in our suffering, because in Jesus, God himself has suffered. He knows what it is to cry. I read out this passage at my friend Rebecca's funeral, and the stunning claim of Jesus is that God has been exactly where I am, weeping at the tomb of a friend. He gets it. Amazingly, Jesus is a fellow sufferer, but he's even more than that. Here's the fourth thing Jesus says to our suffering world. I choose to suffer for you. Jesus ended his life on a cruel Roman cross, facing the very worst of human nature, betrayed, 
tortured, murdered. But mysteriously, Jesus said that dying like this, in the place where only the worst deserve to die, the righteous one for unrighteous people, by dying like this, Jesus would deal with the root problem of all suffering. Not a cosmetic, superficial solution, but an act of cosmic restoration. Dealing with the brokenness of our world by making it possible for us to come back to God. Paying the price in person for our rejection of him. Making it possible for anyone who trusts in Jesus to be part of that new world without suffering in it. Jesus came to suffer to end suffering one day. If you were with us yesterday, that's what we were thinking about. Three days later, despairing and desolate, Jesus' hopeless friends went to his tomb and found it empty. And even though they could barely believe it, encountered him again, saw him, spoke to him, touched him, just as, they, as he said they would. And changed by what they'd seen, they went on to turn the world upside down. Where is God in our pain? What does he know about suffering? Is he absent? No. I see Jesus stepping down to be one of us and stooping to face indescribable agony. I see Jesus stepping up to our questions and our searching and our agony and not pushing it away. Is he cruel? No. I see Jesus dying on a cross for me. I don't understand everything about what he allows. Some of the time, I don't understand anything about it. But when I see where he went for me, I can know there's no cruelty in him. Is he unable? No. Jesus rose again, destroyed death, our most feared enemy left an indelible mark on history and kick-started a community of hope that's growing to this day. Christians don't have all the answers. But in Jesus, we have what we need. Because if I know this God, who can take the evil and sorrow and suffering of Jesus' death and turn it to good, then I can trust him. Then genuine hope is an option. And even in the midst of my pain, Jesus says, I choose to suffer with you. I choose to suffer for you. I know that for many of us, for me, this question comes from the dark places we've been. Jesus' claim is that he knows those dark places intimately. He has been there, and he's able to make his comfort and his presence a reality, even there. And I don't want any of us to miss out on that. What will you do with his offer of, of meaning in your pain, of hope for your future? The stakes are too high with this question. It's too real to treat merely as academic. Whatever you do, don't do nothing. Thank you so much for listening to me. We'll have some questions now. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Niv. Um, so we're going to move into a question of a uh, time of Q&A now. Um, and I think the number, hopefully we'll keep the number um, there, if that's possible, um, to carry on texting questions. So yeah, keep doing that as they come. Um, so yeah, let's go with the first question. Right. So the first question is, why did God take so long before he sent Jesus to change things? And what happened to those who suffered in life before Jesus came? Thank you so much. Why did God take so long before sending Jesus to change things? Uh, what happened to those before Jesus? Very good question. The first thing I want to say is that this is above my pay grade, and I can't tell you why God chooses to do exactly the things he does. If I could, he probably, probably wouldn't be much of a God worth knowing, um, if I could fathom absolutely everything uh, he did. One of the things that the Bible writers are quite keen on saying, though, that Jesus came at the right time. There's a moment where an early Christian writer says, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for us. And there are lots of theories people have as to why the time Jesus came was the right time. But I suspect the reason why it was the right time is because all of us live on the other side of it and are able to hear it. Um, that's what makes it the right time. 
this offer is extended to us. Which leads very neatly to the second part of the question, and again, very well asked. What about those who came before? Job, that book I mentioned earlier, is actually a work that comes from before Jesus came, which shows so much of what I'm talking about, how the reality of suffering <coughs> defies simplistic, easy answers, and that what we need in our suffering more than anything is an experience of a God who can draw close. What that looks like for Job is fascinating. Feel free to go read it for yourself. Um, but what he discovered made sense to him, and I'd love you to have a read and see if it also made sense for you. Worth looking at if this question is yours. What that means, though, is that God, before the coming of Christ, was offering himself to his people through the promises he made, and they could take hold of those promises in faith to know him, not with the same dazzling clarity that the coming of Jesus brought, but truly. Then the question becomes, what about all those people who hadn't heard about him? And again, my, question, my answer there is, I, I don't really know. One of the verses um, from a very early book in the Bible, Genesis the first, is one that stuck with me. And it particularly lodged itself into my heart when Rebecca uh, passed away. It's Genesis 18.25. Abraham is pleading with God for the city of uh, Sodom and, and Gomorrah, these two cities. And the one bargaining chip, if you like, that he has with God is, will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? To which the obvious answer is, yes, he will. And I want to say that that's my confidence now, and it's only enlarged by what I've seen in Jesus. He will do what is right. Um, thank you for that question. I do want to say, though, particularly given what I said at the end there about the stakes being high, that question is not our question. And I I'm sorry that I can't give you a knockdown answer to it. But our question, and, and rather what we need to do on, on the, off the back of, of, of this whole topic, is, is see what we think about what Jesus is, is offering. And I know that question was asked in good faith, and, and I know that. But I do also want to move us on from beyond something that can only be speculative to what's real for all of us. Thank you. Great. Um, just on that idea of uh, trusting that God is a good, good judge and will do what is right, um, this question says, if, as you, as you admit, you can't know the mind of God and you can't understand his reasoning, how do you know for a fact that he is all loving and will do the right, the right thing? Great. To say that I can't understand everything about God is not to say that I can't understand anything about God. I hope that makes sense. The knowledge that Christians have of God in Jesus is true but not exhaustive. And when it comes to this question of suffering, you know what? We are at the, the very end of the tether of what we can know. But that doesn't efface what we do know and that Jesus has shown. Just because I don't know everything doesn't mean I don't know anything. Stepping back, I think that's true for all of our knowledge, actually. Who here could claim exhaustive knowledge of anything, even themselves? And yet, who here would want to say they have no true knowledge of anything, especially themselves? Um, so thank you for that question. There are deep mysteries here. But these are not the kind of mysteries that erase what God has made known in, in Jesus. It, it, they're the kind of mysteries which, which throw me back on what I do know at those times of crisis and pain. And, and I found in my experience, and I'm not the only one who could talk about that in this room, that when I've done that, I found myself secure, upheld. I found my tears heard and, and cherished. There's a verse in the Psalms which says that God bottles up our tears, puts them in his wineskin, writes them down in his scroll. There's so much that I don't understand. But what he's shown of me, that doesn't disappear in, in the mystery of it. That proves solid ground, even when I don't understand everything else. Thanks. Thanks, Niv. Um, okay, our next question. Um, why is Jesus the only way to find meaning in suffering? Can we not find meaning in suffering through the emotional growth that it promotes um, and in what makes us appreciate and what it makes us appreciate about our life outside suffering? Thank you. Um, again, a very well worded question. I wouldn't want to say that Jesus is the only way of finding meaning in your suffering, but I want to say he's the best way of finding real, objective meaning in your suffering. I'll come back to that in a moment. But why can't we just rely on our own emotional development through suffering in order to find meaning through it? A couple of things. Firstly, some people suffer so very hard that they never get to the end of the tunnel, if that's right. They, they never find the light at the end of it. They are just 
stumbling through agony. And if you say to them, well, surely this development and growth is something you can find meaning in, they might want to hit you, and rightly so. The suggestion that all suffering will come to an end in a way we can actually understand and explain in this life is, if I can put it gently, glib, actually. Um, secondly, it matters that the meaning we have for suffering is outside the four walls of my experience and outside the four walls of our culture because that's the only way to make sense of how deeply it offends us and how wrong we think it is. And if making meaning is a free-for-all when it comes to suffering, that leads us to very dangerous territory because then it means that perhaps I could find ways of not finding other people's suffering outrageous and wrong. Maybe I could find ways of devaluing their suffering. It comes back to what we were talking about on Monday about what human beings are worth. If our dignity is anchored to the fact that God made us in his image and loves us and we are precious to him, then no one else's suffering is something I can look at lightly. To quote John Donne, every man's death diminishes me. I'm a part of the whole. If you say that meaning is something that ultimately rests on my ability to find meaning in it, then you actually take that away. Because even if you or I choose to take the John Donne approach, we can't compel anyone else to take it. But if meaning is found in who God made us, then it's possible. Finally, I want to say that Jesus is the truest and best way to find meaning in suffering because he's the only one who steps in from outside the four walls of lived experience. And is the only one who's able to lead us through death, that, as I said yesterday, undiscovered country. Well, I didn't say that. Shakespeare said that. He's the only one who can do those things. So the kind of meaning he can offer is qualitatively different. It's on another scale. And not to have it is to be impoverished. And to have it is to have what you need. Thanks. Um, so one of the things you said um, that Jesus tells us is that it wasn't meant to be like this. Um, and he, this question picks up on that and says, if God is omniscient, he knew exactly how everything would play out when he created the universe. So surely there must be the eventuality that he saw he saw what was going to happen, and therefore, this was an intention of, uh, of design. Great. Um, thank you so much for that question. I was rather hoping it would come up. That, that was a joke. Um, there, there are a couple of ways we talk about God's will in, in, in the Christian faith. One of them is his decreed will, and one of them is, is his sort of hidden will of desire. And I'll just try and give you an example from what this talk was. God's will that he's decreed is that murder is wrong. In a very important sense, he does not will it. And yet, God was able to work in a broken world through the murder of Jesus to bring about life for anyone who trusts him. So in that sense, God desired it. When we say that God, who's omniscient, he could have seen all these things, so in some sense he wanted it, um, that's undeniable. If he is omniscient, then of course he would have known it. If he's eternal, he's outside of time, none of it would have been a surprise to him. Can I say that's exactly the comfort? If none of this was a surprise to him, then his really are the arms safe enough to be in when everything goes wrong. Uh, this weekend, my wife was in an accident, and one of the, the promises of the Bible we've been clinging on to is a verse which says, underneath are the everlasting arms. If it's true that God knew this was happening, permitted it, and is able to work through it, that may raise a host of questions questions I know I'm never going to be able to answer for you and doubt anyone else will get to the bottom of in this life, but it also means that underneath are the everlasting arms. Rather than saying that at bottom is blind, pitiless indifference, what we're saying is that underneath are the everlasting arms. And a God who's big enough to blow your mind on what he was doing when is exactly the kind of God who might be able to help you. And the wonder of the Christian faith is that he doesn't just sit in an abstract world of what he might have been doing well. He stepped into ours. I hope that makes sense, though. It, it was not what he desired. And if you open the, the Bible to the beginning and see, you'll see that he, he called Adam and Eve, his, his, his humans in the garden, not to turn away from him, not to eat this fruit, uh, but to trust him instead. In that sense, it wasn't meant to be this way. Thank you. What is the purpose of suffering that impacts non-human animals? So 
um, instances of suffering where a human is not um, directly involved. Mm. Um, I suppose like natural disasters. What is the purpose of suffering that impacts non-human animals? Can I say, I'm really grateful for your confidence in me because I don't think I've been able to tell you the purpose of suffering for human animals. So the fact you think I could do it for non-human animals, it really says a lot about what you think I'm able to do. Um, sorry, lighthearted. Um, essentially, I, I think that the, the Bible says something fascinating about the world when it says that all creation, all reality is groaning. And that's a way of describing that our world is out of joint and it's, it's painful, it's uncomfortable. It's, it's painful and uncomfortable for reality, if you like. It's painful, it's uncomfortable for the natural world and for non-human animals. One of the things that I've been asked about on this topic before is how resolutely anthropocentric this whole topic seems to be for Christians. The behavior of human beings has an impact on the rest of reality. That's so odd, isn't it? And yet, I find that extremely plausible in today's culture, in which we are being told, quite rightly, I think, that the action of human beings is, is changing our environment and our climate and actually bringing real suffering to non-human animals. So I don't think that's a stretch to believe. Essentially, what the Bible says is that the brokenness between human beings and God, given that God made human beings to be a microcosm of his creation and to steward it and love it and tend it and uh, look after it, when that relationship with him went wrong, everything else went wrong too, and the suffering of non-human animals, nature red in tooth and claw, if you like Tennyson, is a pointer to that, to the groaning of reality, which longs to be put right and the thing that the Bible says is that it will be put right. One of the slightly trippy but actually beautiful visions of the Bible says that there'll be a time when a little baby will put its hand in, in an adder's kind of den, and that will be fine. That's crazy to think, and yet that's exactly what this question's getting at, a time when there won't be suffering for non-human animals, and there won't be violence and predation between us and them, but harmony. Hard to imagine what that would be like, but something that's promised. Thank you. Great. So you, um, you, talked, uh, you talked a bit before about how we, need, we can find solace in knowing that Jesus suffered with us. Um, but there was a question which said, if Jesus knew what was going to happen, surely that's not the same sense of hopeless suffering that we experience. A, a good question. If Jesus knew what was going to happen, surely that's not the same uh, sense of hopeless suffering. Um, there are many things to say about this. One thing to say is that when Jesus dies, and you can read Mark's Gospel, chapter 15, for this, he cries out in utter agony, anguish, and dereliction. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at that point, mysterious though it is, he seems to have entered fully into exactly the desolation you are talking about. A little bit earlier in Mark's Gospel, you can see him in the Garden of Gethsemane, a moment of, again, utter, utter agony for Jesus. He's distraught, and it seems that he's entered fully into everything that's being asked about. That is mysterious, and yet that kind of orbits what Christians have said about Jesus, that he's one person with two natures, a divine one and a human one, that he's taken to himself, and according to his human nature, appears to have suffered entirely that which is being described. Um, that is one of the paradoxes that delighted the early church, that the immortal dies, the invisible becomes visible, and the impassable, i.e. the one who can't suffer, suffers. Um, I want to move things on a little bit and maybe suggest that the fact that Jesus knew what was going to happen made it even harder. Because if it's true that on the cross he was facing the, the judgment and, and condemnation that justly comes to all wrongdoing, and he knew what that was, that in some senses he knows far more than we ever do and ever will what he was going to suffer. And that made it different, sure, but very, very difficult, perhaps far more difficult. Um, in some ways, not knowing everything about suffering makes it less difficult than perhaps knowing exactly what it, it is. I wanna say this very, very tentatively. These are areas of deep mystery, and I don't pretend to have answers on them, but perhaps there's something in that too. Thank you. Great. Um, this is going to be our last question, but um, we have had loads of questions come in, so um, do come to the front later. Niv will be um, hanging around. He'd love to chat and discuss more with you. Um, okay, so our last question is, um, if Jesus suffered for us, why is there still suffering? 
did he did he fail? <laughs> Thank you. One of the things I was trying to get at at the end there was that he makes it possible for any one of us who trust him to be part of that suffering-free world which his death and resurrection are the earnest, the token of. And another letter in the New Testament written by Peter this time, um, the second letter of Peter, chapter 3, talks about how his delay in bringing about that new world is not because he's, you know, fallen asleep or something or isn't effective in what he's going to do, but it's his patience. He isn't wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance, is what it says, and be saved. So the delay of God, as, as difficult as it seems to be in a suffering world, is something the Bible understands as part of his mysterious goodness and patience. If you like, he's open, holding open the gates of heaven as long as, as, long as he as long as he, he can to, to let us in. That's a very uh, fallible way of putting it. And, and yet I do want to say that strand is, is there in the Bible. You also get a strand of desperately praying for God to fix it now. So that in the, the Psalms, the, the songbook of the Old Testament, people cry out, how long, O Lord? So the very last words of the Bible are words in Aramaic saying, come Lord Jesus. We, we, want, we want the suffering to end, we want the pain to end. Of course we do. And yet we know at the same time his patience in not wrapping up history is patience for us. Patience for me when I was living my life opposed to him and would have faced that judgment. Patient with me long enough for me to turn to him. And I take it, patience for all of us in the room today that we might do the same. Yeah. <laughs>